Hello, my name is Dr. Danielle Plotz, and I'm a pediatric neuropsychologist at the Kennedy Krieger Institute. A neuropsychologist, for those that may be unfamiliar with the profession, is someone with specialized training in education and in brain and behavior relationships. I work as a team member as part of a day rehabilitation program for individuals with a variety of diagnoses and conditions, including those with acquired brain injuries. Today, I will be talking to you about traumatic brain injury, commonly referred to as a TBI. The information I am presenting on TBI will be broken up into four short videos. These first four segments will cover topics such as neuroanatomy, classification of brain injury, common sequelae after TBI, and finally a discussion of mild traumatic brain injury, also commonly referred to as a concussion. This is part of a larger series we are recording to provide information to those that may be working with children and adolescents who have had a traumatic brain injury and strategies to help with their success in school and in life. In this first segment, I will focus on neuroanatomy, defined as the study of the structure and organization of the nervous system. In particular, I will be discussing the human brain. Our brains are amazing in so many ways. This powerful jelly-like organ only weighs about three pounds, but is responsible for everything we do and all of the experiences we have. It is situated in your skull and is connected to the spinal cord via the brainstem, making it only one part of the central nervous system, or the CNS. The brain can be divided into three primary regions, including the forebrain, the midbrain, and the hindbrain. The forebrain, which is primarily made up of the cerebral cortex, is the largest part of your brain and contains four pairs of lobes, including the frontal lobe, the temporal lobe, the parietal lobe, and the occipital lobe. The cerebral cortex is what we see when we look at the brain. Each bump on the surface of the brain is known as a gyrus, while each groove is known as a sulcus. The midbrain includes structures like the cerebral aqueduct, the tegmentum, the basis pedunculi, and the tectum. And then finally, the hindbrain includes things like the pons, the medulla oblongata, and the cerebellum. The skull does a very important job, not only holding our brain in place, but also protecting the brain from penetrating injuries. Additionally, the brain is enveloped in protective tissue known as meninges. These are further divided into three layers, the pia, the arachnoid, and the dura, each with their own function. The dura mater, literally translating to tough mother, is the outermost layer providing additional protection to the brain. In between the pia and arachnoid layers, closer to the brain, you'll find cerebral spinal fluid, also known as CSF. The cerebral spinal fluid surrounds the brain and spinal cord, providing yet more protection. The CSF has many other functions as well, including shock absorption and nutrient transportation. The interior anatomy of the skull is also important to understand when we think about brain injuries because the topography and bony protrusions inside of the skull make the surrounding brain tissue, particularly in the frontal and temporal lobes, susceptible to damage. Before I get into an overview of the functions of the parts of the brain, I will briefly mention that there are around 100 billion nerve cells that make up the brain and even more support cells which provide nourishment to these nerve cells. A specific part of these nerve cells include axons, which carry information quickly from one nerve cell to another. Axons are typically covered in a lipid-rich sheath called myelin. This myelin can be thought of like insulation on electrical wiring that helps increase the speed of information transmission. Bundles of these axons with myelin sheaths are similar to information highways transmitting data from one part of the brain to another. That leads me to my discussion about specific functions of different parts of the brain. As I mentioned before, the cerebral cortex is the part of the brain we readily see when looking at the brain. It is the part that functions to make us truly unique with distinctively human traits that include higher level thinking skills, language, reasoning, memory, and imagination. It can be divided into four lobes with the frontmost lobe aptly named the frontal lobe. I think of this lobe as the CEO of the brain. It is associated with executive functioning skills, such as problem solving, working memory, or the ability to manipulate information in your mind. An example might be like mental math and impulse control. It is also where expressive language, motivation, judgment, social behavior, and emotion regulation arise. 
Toward the back of the frontal lobes, there's the motor cortex, where the brain receives information from various parts of the brain and then carries out movement as it sends signals then to the spinal cord. A bit behind and below, inferior to the frontal lobe, is the temporal lobe. The temporal lobes are involved in a number of functions. They're involved in understanding of language, memory, smell, and auditory processing. It is broadly associated with aggressive behaviors, sexual behavior, and emotions. With an injury to this area, you can see a number of impairments. There can be increased difficulty with verbal problem solving, learning new information, emotional regulation, language comprehension, and most famously, difficulty with facial recognition. If you've ever heard the name Oliver Sacks, then you've probably heard of the book, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. In this book, Dr. Sachs describes an injury to the inferior or the bottom temporal gyri that causes difficulty with facial recognition. It is a great read if you've not read it. So keeping with the discussion of the parts of the brain and their functions, moving posteriorly now from the frontal lobes, we have the parietal lobes. The parietal lobes contain the sensory cortex in which information is received from various parts of the brain and the spinal cord about different sensations. This lobe is also involved in spatial awareness, perception, and body awareness with both objects and interacting in space. For example, some people with injuries to this part of the brain can have more difficulty navigating familiar areas and difficulty with using familiar objects like a toothbrush or a key to a house. Visual attention is another area that can be impacted with damage to the parietal lobe particularly to the right parietal lobe, can cause something known as visual neglect. Visual neglect is when you are not attending to one part of space, usually the left side, which is the opposite side of the location of the entry. At the back part of the cerebral cortex, we find the occipital lobe. This is primarily where visual processing is taking place. Damage to this area can cause a variety of problems as well, including visual field cuts, hallucinations, difficulty identifying words, colors, and locating objects. Another large area of the brain beneath the cerebral cortex and part of the hindbrain, as I mentioned, is the cerebellum. This part of the brain helps coordinate movement and with balance. Initially, it was not implicated in much else. However, more recently, researchers have found that the cerebellum does a little bit of everything. It has implications with aspects of language, executive functioning, and other processes. It connects to different parts of the cerebral cortex as well as to the spinal cord. Finally, the brain stem is the part of the brain that connects everything above the neck, if you will, to the spinal cord. It has incredibly important functions that are unconscious in nature, such as the sleep-wake cycle, breathing, heart rate, and arousal. Damage to this part of the brain can be catastrophic. This is just a cursory look at the many functions of this amazing organ. Thank you for watching and look for other topics related to the brain.